Hello and welcome to this presentation on coloboma of the retina. Whether you are a relative or friend of someone affected by coloboma, or just have an interest in embryology, the following will shed light upon one of many birth defects of the eye. It will explore what should happen, what failed to occur, and what, if anything, can be done to correct it. I hope you enjoy this production. So to the introduction, we firstly need to look at what the eyes do, what their role is within the body. So we can see that they can detect external stimuli and they give rise to nerve impulses. The impulses are then sent to the brain for processing and they construct our perception of the outside world. The following video will show the path from external stimuli to the brain. So here we can see the central visual pathway. Now we've got the external stimulus that you can see here coming through to the eyes. Then we've got the nerve impulse. Now it travels on both sides, crosses in the middle, and it basically makes its way along until it gets to the primary visual cortex, which is the part of the brain, part of the occipital lobe. Now, the job of, of the primary visual cortex basically is to receive information from the eyes and allow us to understand the outside world. Let's now look at the clinical features of a coloboma, which basically is an absence of tissue, so a localised gap in the retina. 60 to 90 percent of cases we see here are bilateral, which means that the issue occurs in both eyes, and inferior to the optic disc, so under the optic disc. So we see coloboma due to defective, incomplete closure of the retinal fissure. So the retinal fissure is something that we're going to look at more in both normal and abnormal development. So just something to look out for is that quite often in science, multiple names are given to a very similar issue. So you'll see in the following photos that there's really not a lot of difference between a coloboma, a pit, a tilted disc, and a morning glory disc. Now here we can see a morning glory flower which appears to have visual similarities to the retina. We are able to note here then that the names of these medical issues are given based on their appearance and similarity to other objects or structures. Let's take a look at some statistics before starting normal development. We see one third of coloboma patients with moderately impaired vision, one third with severely impaired vision, and one third experience complete vision loss. Three thirds make a whole, and thus we can note that approximately 99% of coloboma patients have at least some degree of vision loss due to retinal coloboma. 0.13% of ophthalmic patients have coloboma, ophthalmic meaning related to the eye. So eye patients. Coloboma is therefore relatively rare as far as eye conditions are concerned. So now on to normal retinal development. Now we're only interested in the development of the retina because that's the structure that's impacted by our coloboma. So we see that the optic cup gives rise to the retina. The optic cup is something that we'll explore in a, in a video in a second. The cup splits to form a retinal pigment epithelium as well as the, the neural retina, so it splits to form two different layers. The space between the layers is known as the intraretinal space, so that makes sense. Intra meaning between, and retinal is just the retina. At the end of the fifth week, the two layers become closely opposed, though fusion is not firm. So they come back together, but they're separated by just a thin membrane. Hyaloid artery vascularizes the retina, so that's the retina's blood supply. And the inner layer, the neural retina, proliferates to form a thick neuroepithelium. Let's check it out in the following video. So here we can learn about the optic cup and its associated structures. We can see here the optic cup in its very early stages of development. Now as we move down, we're able to see the optic cup, and it's, as we've spoken about earlier, it's split into two. It's got an inner thicker layer, known as the neural retina, and it's got an outer thinner layer, and this layer is known as the retinal pigment epithelium, this layer here. Now we can see the intraretinal space, which we've spoken about as well, and we can see the retinal fissure, which will become particularly important when we speak about abnormal development. Now moving down again here, we can see again these same structures, but then we can see the lens vesicle here. Now the lens vesicle basically initiates a reaction with the neural retina, to make it proliferate into the neuroepithelium. So this newly formed neuroepithelium layer contains photoreceptors known as rods and cones as well as bipolar and ganglion cells. 
Let's explore the anatomy of these structures. So we can see here the newly formed neuroepithelium layer. We've got the light coming in here towards the retina, and then the first bunch of cells it comes across is known as the ganglion cells. They're connected here to the bipolar cells, and then are connected here to the photoreceptors, which we spoke about earlier, and there are two types, the rods and cones. Now if we zoom in here, we're able to understand why they're given their name, and it's based purely on what they look like. We can see the cone here and its triangular shape, its cone shape at the top, and we can see the rod here, it's more rectangular shape at the top. At approximately day 37 of development, the retinal fissure fuses to enclose the hyaloid vessels, the artery and vein. The fusion begins centrally at the 11 mm stage and extends anteriorly and posteriorly until the 13 mm stage. A similar pattern of closure occurs during the development of the neural tube, where the anterior and posterior neuropore fuse, though the fusion began centrally. The proximal portion of the hyaloid artery becomes the central retinal artery, providing the retina with a blood supply. Let's now look at the normal closure of the retinal fissure and the transition of the vessels from hyaloid to central. So we can see here a familiar diagram. And we'll notice earlier that I spoke about the retinal fissure and its importance in later development. As we turn the page here and have a look, we have the developing lens. And again, we have the retinal fissure. We're just looking from a different angle now. And we have the hyaloid vessels running down the midline of that retinal fissure. Moving down again, we still have the developing lens. And we now have the retinal fissure, which is closed in the middle. We can see that it's closing anteriorly towards the lens and also posteriorly, and the hyaloid vessels are still given that name. Moving down again, two, two main things to note here. Firstly, that the retinal fissure is now closed as it should in normal development, and secondly, the hyaloid vessels are no longer known as that. They are now the central vein and artery of the retina. Due to invagination, which is an ingrowth of cells from the surface layer, the neural retina is inverted, meaning that the rods and cones are anatomically furthest from the light. Transparency of the retina allows light to reach photoreceptors irrespective of their position. The pigmented layer absorbs stray light. So let's again explore the retina, this time paying particular attention to its physiology. Here we can see the retina from a slightly different point of view. The light is again coming in from this direction and it's hitting the retina through here. First line of cells we see are the ganglion cells, followed by the bipolar cells, and then the photoreceptors, the rods and cones, which we've spoken about in some detail. Take note though that these two cells, the ganglion and the bipolar cells, need to be transparent. Otherwise the light can't actually interact here with the photoreceptors. We can see again that the nerve fibers actually leave from the ganglion cells and they make up the optic nerve. Also, we can see here the pigmented part of the retina, which we know absorbs the scattered light. Remembering that visual acuity is related to clarity, we are able to note that a newborn has approximately 2400 visual acuity. 2400 meaning that, at 20 feet from a vision chart, they can see clearly what someone with normal vision can see from 400 feet. The following image will allow us to see the world as a newborn would. Notice here the lack of clarity and the somewhat blurred lines. It is clear lines that allow the fully developed adult to achieve face and object recognition. After 10 weeks of life outside the womb, myelination of the optic nerve is complete, allowing significantly improved vision. Myelination occurs to increase the velocity of the nerve transmission. Now to abnormal development. In medical terms, coloboma is defined as an absence of tissue. It is most often caused by a developmental disturbance, though surgery and injury to the eye are also causes, albeit far less frequently. In retinal coloboma, the outer thinner layer of the optic cup, the retinal pigment epithelium, is not fully formed, and it leaves a wide or empty zone inferiorly, meaning under or beneath, and nasally, meaning towards the nose or midline of the body, to the optic disc. Lack of fusion of the retinal fissure is the result of the above events, where the fissure should have closed at the 13mm stage at 5-7 to seven weeks of development. 
Let's examine what went wrong in the following video. So in the normal development section, we examined the following three diagrams, and we made special note of the fact that the retinal fissure closed entirely. During abnormal closure of the retinal fissure, or coloboma, we're able to see closure such as this, where generally the issue is at the posterior part of the, of the fissure, and that's known as the optic papilla or stalk. Now, this is the most common place for non-closure to occur and for a coloboma to be. So as we just saw, the optic papilla and stalk are the last regions of the retinal fissure to fuse, and thus if closure fails to occur, it will be at this site. Both the retinal pigment epithelium and the neural retina, otherwise known as the neuroepithelium layer, failed to fuse, allowing the optic cup to avert and a coloboma to form. Another cause of non-fusion of the retinal fissure is the accelerated development and growth of the neural retina. Colobomas are inherited as an irregular dominant characteristic, meaning that when the allele containing the defect is present, it is passed on. Coloboma is not sex-linked, meaning that it can be passed to and carried by both males and females. There are some cases, however, which have seemingly appeared with no inheritance. This will be further explained during the latest research section. Let's take a look at the consequences of accelerated growth of the neural retina. So you remember this diagram from one of our previous videos. We've got here the inner thick layer known as the neural retina. You can imagine that if it was to have accelerated growth in abnormal development, that would prevent this retinal fissure from fusing. You can think that if this part here was to grow faster than this part, it would fan outwards, and it wouldn't allow the fusion here at the retinal fissure. There has been extensive research into the cause of coloboma. The predominant finding is that genetics are responsible. There are, however, a very small number of patients throughout the world who experience coloboma with no evidence of a genetic cause. This leads us to believe that in rare cases, an environmental cause within the womb may be to blame. This being said, the vast majority of cases are caused by genetics and develop prenatally. Prenatally meaning before birth. Ultra-wide field retinal imaging camera Optimap has allowed diagnosis of coloboma even when asymptomatic, meaning before symptoms are present. 3D technique virtual field eye ground permits visualization of the entire retina from 16 weeks onwards. The eye is mapped out on all axes and MagnaCut removes the frontal portion to allow retinal viewing. Examples of these technologies can be seen in the following images. Here we see an example of the machine used to display the retina in fine detail, and this an example of its image. So colobomas can form in the eyelid, iris, retina or optic nerve. A strong link has been observed between retinal coloboma and Gelbert syndrome, characterised by a slight loss of cerebellum function, leading to balance and coordination issues. Colobomas are not exclusively found in human eyes. They are also present in cats, dogs, pigs and cows. There is an increased likelihood of a detached retina occurring when coloboma is present. An undergoing surgery is not recommended due to high risks for potentially no improvement. The following Where to Find Help section provides websites dedicated to the research of coloboma. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.